Hey kids, today we're going to be talking about an evil ruthless man, second in charge to the most evil organization in the entire world. Oh, you mean Disney? You're going to talk about Disney? You're going to be talking about Disney, aren't you? Close, but no. We're going to talk about Martin Borman, the Nazi. Now, for anybody that doesn't know who Martin Borman is, I'll explain it to you because I don't expect you to know. He was Hitler's number two during Nazi Germany. Now, someone's going to comment saying, Well, what about Hermann Goering? Hermann Goering was supposed to take charge after Hitler in case Hitler ever died. And to that, I say you would literally have to argue which Nazi woke up that morning feeling more racist than the other. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. So, today, I'm going to be talking about Martin Bormann, because his death is shrouded in mystery. Oh, my God. If you read about his death in any history book or Wikipedia, West Germany claims that he died by suicide in 1945, and there's no other interpretation allowed. Now, even though I'm trying to discredit their story, I do personally like it, because I like the idea of Martin Bormann just leaving the Fuhrer bunker going, Sayonara Hitler, and then ditching. Now, the first point that I'd like to make is all the witnesses that say that Martin Bormann died. First is Arthur Axman. Arthur Axman, leader of the Hitler Youth, ooh, that sounds reliable, claimed that Bormann allegedly killed himself along with Ludwig Stumpenfeger outside of a railroad station. The bodies were then found and buried by the station's postmaster and some Nazi youth. The Stumpenfeger family was then sent a letter from the postmaster about his death, but Martin Bormann's family never was. Between the postmaster and some of the Nazi youth witnesses later, the bodies were buried separate. But, uh, you know, some odd 27 years later, when the bodies were finally found, they were found right on top of one another. Huh. Odd. Hmm, it's almost like these anomalies and, you know, holes in the stories aren't adding up because, I don't know, the credible source is Hitler supporters. <laughs> and really, it's like we don't trust their literature. We don't trust their science. We don't trust their way of the world. But, hey, we'll trust their testimony, their history. Yeah, we'll give them that. All right, before it's too late to jump off this tangent train, I'm going to move on to my second point, which is... The forensic analysis of his body. First off, here's his skull. Yeah, this, this is his skull. Jeez, it looks like somebody dipped it in caramel. It looks like a whole darn candy apple at this point. Yeah, that's red lumps of clay. Maybe that doesn't make any sense for somebody that doesn't understand archaeology, but the only place in the world you're going to find the red clay that's lumped all over his skull is not in Europe. But, oh, guess where? South America. Hmm. You know that place where all the Nazi refugees went to? Like Chile, Argentina, Paraguay? Oh my gosh, hunting Hitler wasn't a lie. I don't care who you are, but no scientist has ever once tried to explain away the fact of why there is red clay on this man's skull. So, West Germany, uh, kiss my... You gotta give me some reason, because there's no way that his body had that in Germany. And here's my third point real quick. To answer the question if Martin Bormann could have made it to South America, uh, yeah. Josef Mengele, angel of death, guy who was camping out at Auschwitz killing Jews, testing them, literally got away working at a Mercedes-Benz factory, Going life as normal, life casual, as a normal man. Nobody figured it out for years and years before. Oh, oh, there he is, there he is. Uh, oh my gosh. I'd have loved to have been the guy that goes, hey, he looks like a man that probably hangs out with Jews. No, nah, he probably kills them. And that's it for today, guys. I think we can just not believe West Germany anymore. <laughs>